Hi, and welcome to ATR at Home. Music night, it's Thursday night. I'm your host, Angela Stribling, and wow, tonight is going to be so much fun because we have a radio legend, a music legend. He's a legend in rap, hip hop, just coming off at an American Music Award. He's all ours tonight, and he is my radio family. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Ski. Hey, Angela, <laughs> how are you? I'm wonderful. I need a drum roll. Next time, next time. <laughs> okay, let's do it. How you doing? I'm fantastic. I'm being interviewed by you. Got a great bottle of wine, and I'm good. I I'm love it. You know what I place. Salute. Cheers. Absolutely. So, you know, I mean, we're coming off of something so spectacular. Inauguration day yesterday mm -hmm. was just, you know, I mean, I'm still on such a high. How are you feeling about that, the inauguration? I think it was a great moment in time. And it was, it was, such, a, it was such a great moment because it was such a necessary moment. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't think it would have had the same impact had it not had the same lead up. You know what I mean? And yeah, I just think that everything just aligned so perfect and that's what made it so great. Yeah, and that's a perfect way to put that, the lead up. It really makes you appreciate mm -hmm. just common goodness. Yeah. Isabella from Dubai says hello. Hey, Isabella from Dubai. And Lisa oh, Washington. My brother, uh, my brother-in-law lives in Dubai. Really? Yeah, yes. So we need to go visit. Yeah, absolutely. He's a he's a <laughs> he's a captain for Emirates Airlines. So oh, I love that airline. Yes, Talk about high high styled. Boy. So, you know, I've been excited all day that I get to talk to you about just kicking it about you and your career, and people know you, of course, as a successful radio DJ for so long, and uh, certainly a successful club DJ. But when we go back. You started off wanting to be a lawyer. Is that true? Actually, I was working in Washington, D.C. as as a uh, law clerk and paralegal. And uh, I was right there on Connecticut and K Street. Well, the big law firms. And I just thought that was going to be my life. And, you know, something else happened. And here we are today. But I will tell you that the training that I got from wanting to be a lawyer and understanding how lawyers get ready for trial and preparation and then you know going through uh you know being able to take depositions from people and ask questions and learning how to do that is one of the things that i use when i interview people so those lessons that i learned back then i take with me now when i do major interviews i know what i want a lawyer knows what answers he's going to get out of a particular deposition from interviewing somebody and you're able to read body language and you know everything else and and I use that to this day. I love it. So that's your secret sauce. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> that's a, that's a good thing. I mean it's funny how everything really counts. I mean God and his infinite wisdom who knew mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you know you were going along that path and that wasn't the path that he intended for you. No. Uh, and it and it's crazy because um I at at a very young age, at uh, 20 years old, 19 years old, had my own office at this big law firm with a big window overlooking wow. you know, Connecticut Avenue. And Balling at 20. Balling, yeah. But uh, one of the lawyers that I clerked for um, became my life mentor, became like wow. my father. Huh. And he was the one that encouraged me to follow my passion of being in music. And that's how it all happened. And when did you know that was your passion? How did that happen? I had known that was my passion um, for a very long time. Um, when I was young and I went to live with my father, my dad was what you would call back in the day uh, a hippie. Okay. And, you know, he was into, you know, uh, doing hippie things back in Miami. And free, free spirit, free spirit, having all these wild parties and whatnot. And he was a big concert buff. So I would go with him to these concerts. So I remember as a very small child being the only child that's like six years old at a Rolling Stone concert 
or seeing, you know, Chicago play, wow. you know, or going to, you know, to the brunch, you know, down in Coconut Grove and watching, you know, George Benson and people like that. And I just became a real big music person by following my father. But then when I got older, my mom lived in New York and my family that lived in New York, I had an uncle that owned a very famous club in New York called Harlem World. And Harlem World was one of the birthplaces of hip hop. And being in Harlem World at a very young age around the infinite beginnings of, you know, the very small beginnings of what hip hop is today, I was there. So having both of those things, it kind of just pushed me in that direction. And, you know, the rest is history. It is history and it's continuing though. You're yeah. still, you know, as much as you've done, you're still evolving. Prez Nuff said, said, love your show, man. Keep up yeah. the good work. <laughs> Sheila you, says, you. good evening. Melissa says, hello. Georgia, good evening to both of you. Hello. Thank you. Yeah, Kendra says, hello. The love is coming in. Tell everybody we've got Frank Ski tonight and we want to know everything. So if you have questions, yep. you know, Frank said on the radio today, he is yep. going to answer everything. Every question. <laughs> so go. come on with the comments. Yeah. You know, I, I love this and I love just uh, getting to know you. I mean, I know you. You've, you know, been a part of WHUR for a long time, but there's a lot that I don't know and would love to know. Um, you know, as we talk about your musical career, as I mentioned right before I brought you on, you just won an American Music Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, I didn't actually get to win it personally, like Cardi B got it personally, but, I know, but it was still. my phone. So I, I'm, I'm really happy about that. Um, and I think that there's a lot more to come with it. Um, it's being strategically planned to stretch into this year's award program. Um, so it, it's, it's going to be a lot more coming. I, I, um, I just finished a, um, another album that I have coming out in the spring, late spring called, uh, climate change. It's a, it's kind of a fusion between like new age lounge music. And, um, I am, I am claiming that I will be nominated for a Grammy for that album. That's how oh, I think it is. That's my stuff right there. New Age Lounge. Yeah. I love that. Oh, yeah. my God. So, you know, we didn't say exactly why you got the the nod for the American Music Award. It was your song that yeah. you created a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, there's some whores in this house that they right. started. Talk about that. Tell about that story. So back when I was early into doing music, um, I used to I used to do a series called uh, Frank Ski Club Tracks. And really, as being a DJ and being on the air, we used to have to kind of, in Baltimore at the time, when this music style was beginning, we had to make our own beats by sampling, sampling other people's stuff and putting these tracks together because there was really no music for it out at the time. And I put together this one loop that had a sample from a uh, two live crew that said, you know, in the loop, it said doo doo brown. So somebody actually stole it from the radio station out of my locker. And I was what? very, I was very upset at the time. You know, I was young and I was very upset. And I called my life mentor that I told you about, Mike Lubin. And I said, Mike, somebody just stole this thing out of my locker. And he was like, what was it? I said, it's, it's a, it's a mix that I did. He said, well, can you do it again? I said, yeah, but that's not the point. I, I feel yeah. violated. Somebody at the radio station Heck yeah. broke into my locker and they stole it. And he said, well, if they stole it, that means they want it. So if people want it, you need to make it so that they can buy it. And I had no clue on how to make a record at the time. And he told me that, you know, there's six degrees of separation. So somebody you know knows somebody you know that basically knows how to make a record. So you need to get with them and make this record. So I went and uh, I, I reached out to a partner of mine named Stan Evans, who had, at the time, he was married to uh, Kim Waters, the jazz artist's sister. Oh, and oh. We, called, we called Kim Waters. And That's my Kim buddy, said, Kim. Yeah, Kim said, if you want to make a record the way you're doing it, you need to buy this, this, this equipment. And I did. And I hooked it all up in my house. And Kim came over, showed me how to use everything. And I put that sample back together. And it was empty. So because it was empty, I needed to do more with it. So I started building on it 
And make a long story short, that was the birth of Doo Doo Brown. Wow. But I still wanted to do these loops and samples for people to buy. So I created the Frank Ski Club Tracks. And as I got better, there was stuff that I was making that I could not necessarily put out as Doo Doo Brown because it wasn't necessary in that same style. Mm -hmm. So I would make these other records. And one of them that I made was called there's some whores in the house. And ironically, it's funny because I was doing a party at a club back in Baltimore called the Sports Bar. And I had Luke performing. And the Sports wow. Bar was a party I did every Sunday called Super Sunday. I did it for like 15, 20 years straight in Baltimore at different places. And we're at the Sports Bar. And one of my guys comes up to me and he says, man, you know, Luke is performing. He said, man, there's some hoes in this house. And I, said, and I thought to myself, I said, oh, is that right? And I went home and the next day I put the track together. And while I was in the studio working on um, Doo Doo Brown, I had a producer with me that, that uh, used to be military and he became like our road manager at the time. And I said, I'm working on this track and I know you was in the military. So could you do one of those military cadences like left, right, left? And he said, yeah. I said, but here's what I want you to say. All I want you to say is there's some hoes in this house. And and he went in the he went in the booth and did it. No music under him, whatever. And I have the session tape where I'm like, no, do it again. No, add some more flavor. No, do this, do that. And I finally, after a couple minutes of him doing it, I said, okay, that's enough. And I took that acapella home and I created the record. You know, there's some whores in this house, which Wait, became big. It became a big club underground record, like all over the world. And it's all it's been it's been a classic forever. So I knew somebody people have taken it before and done stuff with it oh. um, that a year earlier, Little Wayne and Gucci oh. Man created a song with it. Um, theirs was a little bit different. But then I had run into the people that are with Cardi and they said, you know, Cardi's going to sample one of your records. And I said, OK. And I get a lot of requests for people to use my music. And this one request came in and it was like. You know, we can't tell you who the artist is. We can't give you any information. We're just going to give you a, a snippet of what the beat is going to sound like. And, you know, you can approve it. And so we got it. And, and me and my agent that handles my music, we listened. And we was like, OK. And I said, I think this is Cardi B. And you I said, it, it just sounds like that. And um, so we went ahead and cleared the sample. And then it was like six months seven months and all of a sudden one day cardi puts out this tease it was like on a wednesday that she was going to have this song drop on a friday and boy angela i was doing like this like exactly please, all please. the hail mary's <laughs> let yeah, it be please, please let it so so it actually turned out where it, it became that and then when i found out that megan was on there with her i was Ooh. like this is this is going to be a big record and and all really all props go to her team because even though the song was something, I think the video in that instant, you know, we we left the era where videos were, you know, were super important to the success oh, yeah. of a song, right? Like if Michael Jackson came out, you know, everybody was like ready for the video, right? It was Gotta like a video. world premiere, right? It was exactly. like get the popcorn, you know, it was big right. when Michael Jackson came out with a video. And I think it was that way for Cardi. And she teased it just right. Oh, and Megan was, Megan was on fire because she had Savage out. And and they just did it the right way. And the genius of that video, which I think cost them a million dollars, the wow. genius of that video really propelled what that song was. And, and I think, you know, a lot of the success is owed to the creative genius of her team and her people around her to be able to do that. That was, that was brilliant. So I'm just happy to be a part of it. So because of that, um, I have coming out um, very soon, probably in the next month or so, the 25th anniversary of Frank Ski Club Tracks, where nice. all of those tracks that I've done are gonna be available in a compilation. So I'm trying to time it because I think Cardi's gonna drop her album and I wanna drop the club tracks at the same time. 
Perfect. Yeah. Congratulations. This is your time right now. Thank you. But it seems like you never stopped, which is really great. You you know, to just keep it going. Uh, Roger writes, what's more rewarding? Oh, here we go. People who do your songs getting rewards or personally winning. I think, you know, what's interesting about that, and I'll tell you the truth, is that that song, Whores in the House, when it came out, um, I had gotten into a really bad record deal, like mm -hmm. most people do, mm -hmm. and I never really saw the real money from my songs years ago. So it, they weren't really big money makers like mm -hmm. they should have been, right? Um, because really, we just you know it was all stolen. But I never lost ownership of my writing, and for people who do music, thank God music, for that. There, there's there's like there's two sides of the equation when a song is made. There's what they call the masters, and that's the performance of the song. So that's the performers. That's Cardi B. That's Megan. Sometimes the people that make the beat or the artists that play on the record, you know, the musical instrument artist or whatever, or the sheet music. I mean, the artists that play on the record are part of the master. So that's part of the money that's made. The other part of the money that's made is the publishing. And the publishing has everything to do with the sheet music, meaning the sheet music itself, the whoever wrote it, the words, the music and whatever. And when somebody samples one of my songs or anybody's song, the person that makes the money is the person that wrote the song. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily, and with a lot of songs out now, a lot of these rappers and artists, they don't write their own music. So the money that they're making is the performance money um, and then when they go out on tours, but the long money is publishing. the publishing money. Yeah. And yeah. I think that um, I'm, I'm happy that, you know, again, my life mentor who did all of my deals because he was a lawyer. He was like, you're always going to own this and this is going to mean something one day. So for Harley to sample it 28 years later, Ooh. that's the thing. It's been 28 years. Mm. Mm, mm, so for somebody mm. to sample it 28 years later and give it new life, I think that is extremely rewarding. It's extremely rewarding. That's amazing. Diane says, thank you, Frank. I heard you on the radio today and you spent summers in South Carolina. What part, if you can say? She says she's from Summerton, South Carolina. It was way out in the country and I can't even <laughs> tell you. All I know, all I know is that, to, that once we got to my great grandmother's house, there was no going nowhere. There was a <laughs> dirt <here>. road <laughs> that took like an hour to walk down the dirt road. And there was like, it was like a little corn, there was like a little store in the middle of a dirt road. And that store had just about everything, you know, <laughs> from candy to meat and eggs and okay. batteries, you know what I'm saying? And that was it. There was nothing in this town, nothing, nothing, nothing. That's um, like a movie. <laughs> but, but yes, yes, but like family. And that was it. And she didn't have a TV. So could you imagine being oh a kid? My the whole time? No television, no yeah. nothing. Yeah. But you know, kids had to be creative then. You had yeah. to be really creative. You go outside yeah. and play. But then yeah. once you get back in the house, I don't know what you do with no TV. Yeah, that was that was that was something back in the day. But you know, we made it work. You made it work. And look at you now. Yeah. Lawan said, Frank Ski, thank you for your gift of music. Oh, that's thank beautiful. You. DJ Wheezy said, What's up, HUR fam? Hey. What's up? So, you know, I love this and I love, uh, you know, your your career path. Your songs are classics. Thank Wobble. You. Talk yeah. about that. So Wobble was um, I was actually there was a long time when I moved um, from the DMV to Atlanta to do morning radio. Mm -hmm. I was so busy. And even though I, I moved my studio and I had a studio and I was going to continue to make music, I stopped and I didn't make music for a very, very long time. Um, and I got a call from this DJ College Park and he said, you know, we have this song. We want you to, um, you know, be Frank Ski on the beginning of it. And I said, OK. And, and he never sent me the song. He told me the name of the song and he told me um, how fast it was, the BPM. And I went in the studio with my production guy at the time, Danny Class. Uh, I got off the air at the radio station, went to the radio station production studio in the back, 
Okay. And I wrote the hooks for Wobble and I did it over a click beat, just like click, click, oh. click. Cause I didn't have the beat of the song and I did it and I sent it to them and it came out. <clears throat> um, I wish I would have gotten more of the song, but I didn't. Um, and the song was actually out for about three years and it never did anything until somebody made it into a line dance. And then it started picking up some traction and then Beyonce posted a video from her family cookout and Whoa. they were doing it uh, in, in, in Texas. And that's the thing that propelled that song through the stratosphere. Wow. And um, I can be Angela, I kid you not, I have been around the world and it doesn't matter where I go around the world, they will play that record. And it doesn't matter, they will play it in, in, in Asian countries everywhere and everybody knows that dance. And it's it, a classic. It is I, I remember classic. walking through Disney with my kids many years ago and they were playing it in Disney and my son was like, are you getting paid? <laughs> exactly. Are you getting paid? Yeah. Your son's been talking to the lawyer, your hey. mentor. <laughs> which, is, which is crazy because now, interesting enough, now every business deal that I do, I take my sons Good. that are in the music industry with me and we negotiate everything That's together. So, yeah. Because I just want to make sure that you know, when the time comes where I'm not here and then they control all this, they understand the effort that we went through, you know, and they understand the value of what it is that we have. And I think it's important to, I wish I would have done it earlier, but it's very important to include your children yeah. in your everyday work. Too many parents ask the kids how their day was, but they never really share with their kids exactly what their parents really do. You're and, right, I mean, and culturally, I mean, we don't, or no, traditionally, we don't do don't really talk about finances. Don't no. talk about the bills, or, you know, at the dinner table. No. Don't nope. talk about investing in stocks. You know, nope. don't talk about what you just broke down a little while ago, being an artist versus owning your publishing yeah. and writing your songs and owning your masters and all of that stuff. So, you know, you say you wish you would have done it earlier, but I'm glad you're doing it now. It's, yeah, I, I'm glad. Yeah. yeah. Philip says you saw a lot of that with Motown. Barry obviously made the money, but the performers, Smokey Robinson, Stevie Wonder, making it because they were also writers. The rest of Motown artists did well while they, while they could still tour, but they have no passive income. That's so true. And that is such a heartbreaker. Thank you for that comment. Yeah. You hear, you know, these, these legends, these artists that we all revere, and then you hear that they die broke. Yeah. And, and what people don't so know true. is right now, the biggest commodity in the world is not like gold or oil. If you've been watching the news, the biggest commodity in the world is publishing. And they've been buying, they, there's been a, you know, everybody from Bruce Springsteen oh, yeah. on down, they've been buying their publishing catalogs because the publishing music is our soundtrack to our life. Mm -hmm. And every time, you know, just to give you an example, right? So we saw Katy Perry last night in the inauguration singing fireworks. Mm -hmm. Okay, her singing that song, whoever wrote that song, they're the ones that got paid. Yeah. You know, Katy Perry might not have written that song. I, let's hope she did for her sake. <laughs> she performed it, but whoever wrote that song is the person that made the money. So like, even when, you know, um, even you talked about the American Music Awards. So every time, they said, you know, uh, you know, uh, in the beginning, you know, we they they did a little parody performance with it. I got paid Good every job. time they said nominated for so and so, and they play that little clip of the song. I got paid. So that's yes. what publishing is, you know, I love it. And, and, and that's important. It is important, and I'm sure with all of this, you know, coming to the light. That had a lot to do with your current deal. You just uh, got something really spectacular going with yeah. Sony, a publishing deal with them. Tell, tell us about that, if you can. So I'm all in your business, Frank. So, but here, no, here, here's, here's the interesting thing. So I've had songs out for a very long time, and I never had <clears throat> a publishing deal. I had my writing. I, I was with a, a writer's group, BMI, um, and I would get checks. Like, you know, I... I I get checks to this day, like every time a football team or basketball team plays my song at the stadium, you know, they send money. 
And awesome. that's how the publishing works. But I never had anybody really go out and find and collect that money. And that's what, um, that's what publishing is and a publishing deal does. There's two ways publishing deals work. One way, which most of our artists back in the day did that really made a lot of them broke is that when they made the album, they also sold part of their publishing because they wanted those big upfront checks. Mm -hmm. And the you know buying publishing in the beginning for an album that's not even out yet, you really don't know what the value is, but they can, the record companies, they pretty much, they can calculate it and they used to sell their publishing. So there is where somebody comes in and buys the publishing and those checks are really, really big, right? And then there is what they call administer your publishing, which is just somebody that goes out and takes your music and puts it in places. So now they're doing, you know, the, you know, 50 is doing the BMF story and, you know, because they're out of Chicago and Detroit and that whole movement of the BMF drug gang, um, they're probably going to use a whole bunch of my music for that. So, but that's what Sony does. They go out and they find those type of deals to put my music to work. And for them doing that, they take a piece of everything they bring in. Okay, but they're more than likely going to garner a lot of money for you. Kevin says, watching you from Johannesburg, South yeah. Africa, Joburg. I love Johannesburg. Yeah, me too. And uh, right now, learning a lot about the music industry. Thank you to Frank Ski. You know, I, I know that you've got, you know, your publishing deal with Sony, and you're also working with other artists. Are you looking for different artists that you can sign or what? No, I, I, I did that early on and it was, it was a bit of a headache for me because it's a responsibility. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately I don't have the time to be responsible for somebody else, yeah. you know, and, and, and unless you really are willing to work for somebody else, just finding and signing somebody and taking their money and not doing the work is yeah. not really in my heart. So um, I'm working now, believe it or not, the, the, the real music person is my son, Harrison. Really? And yeah, so when the Sony deal happened and Harrison was with, with me, he was already working on an album that I was helping him to put out. And so now everybody is, is hearing his music and going after him. So Harrison has songs that are being placed with um, Neo and Beyonce. And all of this has happened within a year for him. So he's really the production kid, but he, but he's a musical person. You know, he's, I, I remember I sat down with, um, with one of the uh, early trumpet players um, that was with Chuck Brown when he started. Okay. And um, we were talking about Harrison and he said, you know, Harrison has what they call tone. And I had never heard that term before. And he says, he sees music. And I said, yeah, Harrison sees music and colors and he can play by ear and his yeah. tone and everything is like perfect. So he, he started playing the trumpet, he's learned to play other instruments and, but he's, so with some of my, with that, that, that climate change album that I told you that's coming, that's kind of like new age and, and lounge, wow. he, he's, you know, he's, I let him write five of the songs with me, Nice. you know, just to make sure. And, you know, I, I told him, I said, this is, this is, you know, Right now, if you're into music and you make music, there is no excuse not to put your music out because it doesn't cost you anything to do it. Yeah. You can put it out on the platforms. It'll get everywhere. And if it hits, people will buy it. Yeah. And if they buy it, you'll make money. And if you really work at it, you can really do that. Um, but there is a formula. And for a lot of people, they don't really understand the formula. They see people streaming and they don't know what that means, you know? But for instance, like Spotify pays 0 .003, 0 .003 per song, right? Not so, gonna get rich off of that. Huh? You're not gonna get rich off of that. No, no, no. So basically it's, it's $3 for a thousand streams, but it's $3,000 for a million streams. 
you know, Apple pays a little bit more. Uh, YouTube will give you $2,000 for a million views on YouTube. But if you're out there, why not do it, right? Because yeah. you've yeah. got so many platforms and it doesn't cost any money to do it. So anybody who has music, they should really consider just, you know, putting an album together, yeah. putting it out because you never know, you know, somebody else may hear and somebody may sample your little song. Just like exactly. you know, I, tell people, I tell people all the time, you know, that old town road song and How you, about know, that? you know what I mean? The kid that made the beat was on this website selling beats and you know, he might've made $25 for the beat. But right. it's not you. Look at him now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Money now people are making money. So, who knows? Hey, you might as well do it. Might and well. in this pandemic, you know, I mean, that is one positive thing that, you know, yeah. the world being slowed down to a screeching halt. That's one positive thing that's come out of it. People have the time yeah. to, uh, you know, do the things that really do it for them. And yeah. uh, if I wouldn't, if I wouldn't, and and I, I just want to say this, you know, I, I, I talk a lot about faith and following God a lot in my inspirational vitamin. And it was no mistake, everything that happened for me last year, leading into this year. God had already told me last year, during this time, last year, like November, to put my studio back in my house. Remember, I had been, I'd been 20 years with no studio. Wow. And to put one in my house. So I started saying, okay, I'm going to do that. And I had this idea, you know what, I should find my old music and put this you know, 25th anniversary out. And I kid you not. So I build the studio. I finished the studio in early March. I finished the studio two weeks before everything shut down before COVID. I was on the radio in Atlanta in the morning. And I was the only one that had a studio at my house. And I had already had it set up. So all I needed was the equipment just to plug back into the radio station, right. you know, into the studios. And when that happened, it was like, wow, thank you, God. You know, exactly. here I am right here. I'm, I'm already set up. I don't need to go buy anything or do anything. I'm ready to go. Yeah. And then because everything was shut down, it gave me the time to find all my old music, to put things together, to start working on things. And when I put when I when I put all this together and I found the songs that I wanted to put on this compilation. That week was the week that the Cardi record came out. And wow. then and then when oh Sony, hit me, Sony hit me and said, you know, well, we're going to do this deal for you, but we need everything you've ever made. Anything you've ever made or anything you've ever worked on, we need everything. Angela, I didn't know how much stuff I had until I found this box of DAT tapes of all my stuff. And it took me like a week to listen to all these DATs to right. find these songs. And we're talking 75, 100 pieces of music. I had to go through. Oh my if, gosh. If I was working on the morning and we weren't in COVID, none of that would have happened. No, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have had the time to do it. I wouldn't have had the time to do it. So the fact that COVID hit gave me the time mm -hmm. to be able to do it. So because COVID hit, you shouldn't be doing nothing. You right. know, one of the things I did when COVID hit, I, I went in my backyard and I put a garden with a pond, a koi pond, and oh, a good koi pond so I can be outside and relaxing. And so there's always something to do. And I think you're right. Like COVID gave us a, a real good time to stop. But, you know, the other part of it was, you know, God told me to do it. And, yeah. and I did it. And interesting when, when God had told me it was time to walk away from my current situation um, that I was in at the time in Atlanta, it was a very scary thing. Like, you know, in radio, like you walk away and then you might be out a month, you might be out a year, you might be might out- Might not get back. <laughs> you know, yeah. Depending on what happens. And it just so happened because I had a studio, I was able to come back to HUR, which yeah. was like a beautiful thing, right? Yeah. And And because I was able to put this music out, I was able to get income you know, to, to work at HUR and to still get income and keep my kids in college, yeah. and, you know, do all the stuff I needed to do. So walking away wasn't such a big sting, but it really helped me to 
relax and realize what the beautiful things, you know, that I really wanted to do. And I really wanted to come back and work, you know, with Al at WHUR and Sean and you. And I really wanted to do that. And I think COVID really helped me to be able to stop and say, you know what, this thing that I'm doing at the time in Atlanta was not satisfying me. And that's not what God wanted me to do. Yeah. And God wanted me to be in Washington, D.C. on the radio during the inauguration of Kamala Harris. Absolutely. And And that's where I was supposed to be. It's it's exactly where you were supposed to be. I believe that too. And you talk about how God tells you things. I believe he speaks to all of us. And when we don't listen to that voice, that's when we go down the wrong path. Yeah. Apparently what you were doing, you know, it had run its course. Yeah. And yeah, shout out to Al Payne, Sean Plater, you know, for bringing you back home to WHUR. Yeah. And uh, as you can tell in the comments, you're getting so much love. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, Diane says, hello, uh, Kevin, watch. Oh, that was Johannesburg. Roger says, how does an unknown musical act get their music playing on the radio? And how is it different now than when you came out? I well, guess when you first got in the radio. So, so here, here, here's the thing. Radio is less valuable to an artist than it used to be. Mm-hmm. It used to be the only way right. people would hear your stuff was on the radio. Now it's not so much. You know, um, my my sons who are twenty and twenty one don't listen to the radio. My shame on them for shame. My kids have not listened to me on the radio since they were 10. And they only did it when they were driving to school in the morning. (laughs) They had to. Made them listen. Exactly. You better know. Other than that, they have no interest in listening to the radio because everything that they want is at their fingertips. You got Spotify, you got Apple Music, you know, you, you got all these different platforms to get what you want. You got YouTube music. And guess what? They don't have to buy anything. Yeah. Because all they do is need to get a subscription to a platform and they can play the songs as many times as they want. And I think that for an artist, I think we have to get back. To, okay, here's here's what it's like. It's like being a artist that paints. An artist that paints is not painting for someone to buy their painting. They're painting because they love to paint. If someone buys their painting, that's an added value to them. Mm. But artists who are creative are not the best business people right? because that's just the different side of the brain. So for them, they appreciate and they talk to the world through their art. It's like making this wine. The winemaker does not care that this bottle costs what it costs. He doesn't care. What he cares about is people appreciating his art and what he has built in this glass. So to any artist out there, do what you love. Do what you love. The business side of it is easier than ever now because you really, you know, you don't have to, you know, get the middleman. You don't have to get, you can put your own music up. You can create your own thing. And everybody knows somebody that knows somebody that can help them with the visual art piece on the front. Everybody knows somebody. And then just put it out. And when you put it out, your friends don't have to buy it no more. So you can tell your friends it's there. Just tell them to listen and get an opinionated ear. And if you're open to people saying, I like that, or I did not like that for whatever reason, you start to develop into what it is that you want to be. And there's nothing wrong with it. I love this. Yes, that's great advice. And you were talking about that a little bit earlier, you know, that it's so easy to just stream your music, you know, look at little Nas X, you know, and look at, you know, many, many, many examples of people who just, you know, did what they do on YouTube. Yeah. Or, you know, or other other places. Uh, Anthony says, best show in the afternoon. Got that right. Thank you. Isabella says, so true. You know, so yeah, she's co-signing what you said. Curtis said, Dale Gross. Do you know Dale Gross? Mm-mm. I, I probably do. Okay. 
Shout yeah. out anyway. We just shouted you out, Kurt Dale. Gross and Dale Gross. <laughs> yeah. So Frank, you know, I mean, I love what you do. Obviously, you're a great uh, musical person. You know, you know music. You've got a great ear for music. You're a great producer and uh, certainly a radio legend. I'm so glad you're back at WHUR. And it sounds Thank like you're you. having fun. I'm having so much fun in the afternoon. I really, you know, and, and it's, it's so, you know, having my girl Nina with me, it's so carefree. Having the crew that we have that helps every day between, you know, Sean and, and you know, Herb and yeah. just, you know, DJ Iron and Chris. And it's just, we, we just got a fantastic team of good, hardworking people that just, you know, everybody's working for the, but we're having fun. And at the end of the day, that's what really our job is. And we do have to be disciplined enough to give whatever news we need to do, but give, you know, the DMV a chance to laugh and have fun, but also a chance to vent and give in on their opinions. And, and, you know, I am, I am a, I am for lack of a better word. And I hate to say it. I am a shit starter on the radio. And sometimes <laughs> I say things to get it started, not necessarily because it's true. But sometimes good. I'll say it just to get it started. And uh, <laughs> people get so mad at me, but, you know, I, whenever somebody gets mad at me, I, 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 you know, I get back on there with them on my DMs or whatever. And by the time <laughs> we laugh, you know, so it, it's it's fun. You know, I was going to ask you, what do you think is your secret sauce? Because, I mean, afternoons at WHUR are winning in such a big way. And you and Nina are definitely doing your thing. People don't miss your show. Is it that? Is it because you and Nina have your... I love that you, you don't always agree on everything. Yeah. In fact, you rarely do, and that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what do you think, in your words, what do you think is the secret sauce to successful Frank Ski Show? I think it's, it's, it's um, being on, having your finger on the pulse of the culture. And it requires you to be engaged with the culture 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And it also requires you to be, you know, social media has made vulnerability and people be able to peek into people's personal lives. And you have to be open and honest about things that have happened to you and, and you know, bring your true experiences. Um, but at the same time, um, it's very important on the business side of it. I think a lot of people have really, truly forgotten um, what being a radio host really is. Mm. And I think, you know, there is a certain expectation that someone has, first of all, and you have to meet their expectation, but exceed their expectation. Yeah. And when you do that, you find people that really truly like you. And, and it's, it's so nice to hear people say, Oh, I, I usually don't agree with you, but I agree with you today. Or I usually agree with you, but I don't agree with you today. Or, you know, Nina was right. Or Frank, Nina just don't listen. Don't even try to make her listen. <laughs> and basically, because people really get a chance to escape from what they're really doing. And that's really what our job is. Yeah. And I think um, the professionalism in what we do, you know, the listeners don't know what a break is. They don't know what quarter hour listening is. Right. They don't know what, you know, these meters that judge us are. They don't know the business side of it. They just know what they hear and what they respect. And you and I have been doing this for so long. And, you know, you don't know this, but when I was first in DC, I would, I would listen to you. Like, like you've always had the golden voice, right? You've always been like yeah. that golden person. And, and that's very important. You know what I mean? I, I did a clubhouse call um, not long ago with, with some other really popular um, radio people for Radio Facts magazine. And there was all these people that had been out of work because of COVID and radio mm. stations shut down. And I said, you know what the most important thing is? Radio still is about the voice. It still is about learning how to talk on the yeah. radio, right? Yeah. And it still is the important thing. I said, nobody should know by listening to the radio where you're from. That's right. Nobody That's should know. Radio 101. <laughs> you know what I'm it's saying? True. But I said, some of y'all is trying to be so cool and so hip to where you're from that now you can't find another job right. outside of your market. You know? <laughs> That's right. right. 
But at the same time, you know, you gotta you gotta really understand. And and I and I and I told them, I said, um, I said, my job is because I'm the leader of the show, my job is to is to make other people leaders and to build and make people stars. So Nina is a star. She's never had this avenue, but when we opened it for her, she stepped right in and I already knew she was a star. And I had been trying to get people to see it, but it wasn't until I came home to HUR where I was able to really let her shine. So and it's so it, beautiful. It yeah, works shine so well. and, and she can she can be the star she is. That's yeah. important. Um, yeah. the other side of it is is that at the end of the day, my job is to give people um inspiration to make them laugh and give them information, but not really tell them why I'm doing it. And there, and you know, create ourselves into um, a brand of what we stand for. There's so many people that do this, Angela, that people don't even know what you stand for. They yeah. don't, they don't, they don't know what you care about in life, who you right. are, you know, like, like you can listen to the show and know Nina really cares about her kids or right. she really cares about people or things that she's been vulnerable. She cries on the air and, you know, we get emotional about things because it's, it's really, it's really important that people- You're both have, very authentic. Both you people. have to be. And, and people really resonate because be. people can spot it. If you're yeah. just being fake and just going through the motions, no one yeah. wants any parts of that because yeah. then yeah. they're not free to let you know who they are. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you got to be good with time. Like I can read a 60 second commercial and I know what 60 seconds is without looking at a clock anymore like you do, yeah. you know, but that's important. So I remember on the on the call, I said, you know, I said, most of you all who do radio don't even know what your job really is. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I said, you know, who knows what your job really is? And it's like, oh, entertain and talk to people and play music and da da da. And they gave 100 million questions. And I was like, no, nah, that's not my job. I said, my job is to sell commercials. I said, that's my job. That's really the job right there. That's it. <laughs> you my brought it right sell there. <laughs> Everybody got to make some money. Let's be real. <laughs> up what a a it's a business, people. <laughs> Let's see. Bubba, thank you, Frank and Angela. Love this. I'm going back down memory lane. Oh, and we had another, a Prez Nuff said, and he always comes on these lives, and we so appreciate you, Prez. He said, uh, Frank built a foundation for his sons. I admire that. That's pretty cool. That really is. Yeah, thank you. Really is paying it forward. And, you know, not just doing this for you selfishly for the, the ego and, you know, because it is quite a heady business. I mean, you're, you're a star and you have been for a very long time. And it's easy to just kind of go that route and, you know, go for yours and not necessarily pay it forward. It's important. What's important for people to know um, is my job is not about me. It's not about me, and it's never been about me. When I when I would DJ a party, the most important person is the person that paid their money to come in and see me at this party. That's, That's the most right important there. person, right? Yeah. So it's not about me and what records I like and whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm here to put on a show because you pay for the show. I'm not here, right? you know, uh, doing radio for me, I'm doing radio because I'm serving the community. And part of that service becomes all the nonprofit work, becomes the volunteer work, it becomes it becomes being being a source of information and caring about people's well being and caring about the community that we serve. That's what we do, you know? And and if it doesn't and, and going back to I, I gotta tell you this, you know, Nina started as my intern with my kids foundation. No, I didn't know that. Yes. I just knew her as your producer. Nope, she started as an intern with my kids foundation. And then, then she came in as an intern with the radio station. And I made everybody who works for me to work through the kids foundation, because you gotta know where my heart is. You gotta know this is the community that we serve. Mm -hmm. And she became more of, she became, Nina became the concierge for celebrities when they came to Atlanta. Okay. Like they would call me, and they'd be like, where should, where should I stay? And then they stopped calling me and they would just call Nina. Okay. They, you know, when they need a dinner reservation, when they need a ride from the airport, when they need whatever, she was humble enough to, to do that work I and pick that. people up and do things because it's really all about service. But yeah. you know, once you pay your dues and that's what we have to do for God to pay our dues, mm -hmm. he blesses us back. We have to pay it forward. 
You know, Frank, I mean, that is it in a nutshell. I mean, you have it right. <laughs> and I'm sure that's why you're so successful because you're right. That's all God wants us to do. Yes, you know, in whatever our career path, whatever it is, take the ego mm -hmm. out of it and know that it really is all about the service. You do that and you win. Yes. So, yeah. Frank, thank you so much. I thank mean, there's you. so much more we can talk about. Congratulations on everything. You're, you know, you've got a, a beautiful family there. You've got a, a, I guess not quite a new baby anymore. How old is your son? Emerson, Emerson now is, she is um, 22 months. Oh gosh. Okay. She's still a new baby. Yeah. She's still a new baby, but Aww. it, you know, and you know what the best part is being able to, you know, uh, through the pandemic work from home and yeah. to see her and, you know, to be able to spend time and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm here every day, you know, doing the show. And then when, you know, when she comes in from, you know, her little daycare school, she runs in every day, oh. runs into the studio oh, oh, man. And, and it's, it's the best, you know, and I, I'm just, I'm just happy. I'm able to do it at this point. So Heck, yeah. cool. and she's also made me you know, honestly, truly like 10 years younger. I mean, she really has taken like 10 years off my life, Aww. maybe 10 years, 10 years younger. How you know? beautiful is that? That is great. It really is, you know? Yeah. I mean, because I would think, it, you know, I mean, it's a lot. She's got a lot of energy and you've got to run around and everything and keep mm -hmm. up with her. But I guess that's what keeps you young. Yeah, I was, you know, you know, Thursdays are our swim day. We go swimming and she goes to swim class and, you know, it, it gives me a chance to, you know, to get out there and she loves getting on the back of my bike and going on the trail. And <laughs> She's like, Daddy, we're yeah. doing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what you're thinking. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. Well, thank you all thank in you. the comments section. Uh, Emerson is Ward's middle name. Bubba says peace and blessings to oh, WTR. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, Nadine, not only are you a star, but a philanthropist as well. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Frank, we love you so much. So glad that you're back home where you belong and yes. WTR. Yes. And keep doing what you do. And yes. congratulations on your music coming out. Thank you very much. And you're going to be really, really proud. So I look forward to letting you hear it. I can't wait. And it's, yeah, yeah. I love Lounge. Oh, yes. yes. Throw yes. a little jazz in there. You're going to love it. <laughs> I already know. Okay. Right, Frank, I guess I've, we've taken up enough of your time tonight. This has Thank been you amazing. So much. Cheers, Thank everyone. You. Have a good night. Cheers you to too. you. Bye bye. Bye. Wow. Frank Ski, that was so amazing. Just talking to him about everything, music especially. So when his music does come out, make sure you keep supporting him and support the Frank Ski Show with, of course, my girl, Nina Brown, every Monday through Friday, three o'clock, right on your favorite radio station, 96.3 WHUR. Make sure you stay tuned in to WHUR.com for everything we're doing at HUR at Home. I'm your host, Angela Stribling, and I want to invite you to check us out Sunday nights, right after the original Quiet Storm, for Pillow Talk with Angela. Thanks again for all your comments tonight. Have a good night.